Hello Bay Ridge. Welcome to another edition of After Hours. Today I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about why Jesus called himself the Son of Man. I mentioned in the teaching today that it was really unusual to see that Peter used the title we tend to think of for Jesus, which is the Christ or the Messiah. We even use that he's Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the most common thing, but Jesus immediately responds by talking about what's going to happen to the Son of Man. Why is it that he does this? Why does he so prefer the title? He very rarely refers to himself as the Christ. He usually refers to himself as the Son of Man, and oftentimes even later on when the priest asks him if he is the, the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One, he's going to say yes, and you're going to see the Son of Man. And he kind of goes back to that title. Why does Jesus so like this title, Son of Man? Well, there are several reasons. Number one, as I mentioned on Sunday morning, uh, there's too many misconceptions at the time regarding what it meant to be the Christ or the Messiah. Again, Christ is just the Greek word Christos. Uh, the word Messiah comes from the Hebrew Mashiach. They're the same word. The Christ or Messiah was a very common conception among the people of Israel. And as I quoted on Sunday morning from a commentary, a targum on Genesis 49, um, they had an understanding that the, the Messiah, the Christ, was going to come and he was going to be a political figure. He was going to be a military figure. He was going to engage in physical war crush his enemies, uh, and that was the conception of who the Messiah was going to be. And for that reason, Jesus almost entirely steered clear of that term because there were just too much, um, too many misconceptions. There was too much baggage surrounding the term. But there are many other reasons that are very positive for the use of the Son of Man because it is a very, very rich term throughout the Scripture. So let me go over a few of those reasons. One of the things is when we say that Jesus is the Son of Man, we are pointing out the fact that he is truly and fully human. Uh, this is why, for example, the Gospels begin with the genealogies, or Matthew begins with the genealogy. Uh, Luke doesn't bring his in until Luke chapter 3. But we see these genealogies of who Jesus is because they are trying to stress that Jesus is truly and fully human. This later on became a controversy in the church. There were those who so stressed the deity of Christ, they wanted to say he wasn't actually human. They want to say he's the son of God, but not that he's the son of man. But Jesus is saying, no, I actually am truly and fully human. And in saying that, that leads to the second reason, which means Jesus is not only really human, he is actually the true man. He is actually the ideal uh, human. He is what the, the New Testament refers to a lot of times as the second Adam. And it does this pulling off of concepts in the uh, Old Testament. Uh, you remember in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see that God creates humans, and the word for man and the name Adam are actually the same word in Hebrew. So it's even hard sometimes to say, is it the man or is it Adam uh, that is being referenced here? But, but Adam is this first human, and he's given a call that he is the image of God, and he is to rule as God's vice regent, so to speak, uh, displaying and multiplying God's image and causing the will of God to be accomplished in the world. Of course, Adam fails at this, he falls, uh, but Psalm 8 comes back and says that this is still our call, and it refers to the Son of Man. What, who, what is man that you care for him? The son of man that you care for him. But it says that, that this son of man is still going to rule over all things. And this is this important concept of fulfilling what God had called Adam to do. Well, the New Testament picks up on this uh, in, for example, Romans 5 and in 1 Corinthians 15, in both places we see where it speaks of uh, 
Adam and Christ and Jesus being a second Adam or the the first Adam and the last Adam. And in doing this, it's saying that Jesus is actually the head of a new humanity. As all humanity has come from Adam, so all of the new humanity, the redeemed humanity comes from Jesus. But even more than that, in the Psalm 8 sense, and it's quoted, uh, Psalm 8 is quoted in 1 Corinthians 15 and also in Hebrews 2 to say, look, God's original intent for humanity to rule and reign under God, to accomplish the will of God, is back on track because it's being done by the true man, the new Adam, the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And so as the son of man, he is not just truly human, he's human in the way we were always meant to be human, and he's restoring that for us. The third thing is that in Daniel 7, there is a reference to the Son of Man. If you look in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, and Jesus references this actually when he's standing on trial before the Sanhedrin, Daniel says that in his vision he looked and there before him was one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days, was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples and nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's again Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And notice there that this Son of Man is one who has been given authority and power by the Ancient of Days, which is the Father, uh, and, and that he is going to exercise that authority. Well, if you remember, the, one of the first times Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man is in Mark chapter 2, where he says, he's forgiving a man's sins. And the people are thinking, how can he do this? He's blaspheming. And Jesus says, so that you know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, and he heals the paralytic. He goes on and says that the Son of Man has authority over the Sabbath. So when Jesus is drawing on this and he's using this title, he's making a reference back to Daniel chapter 7 and saying, I am that Son of Man who has authority that has been granted by the Ancient of Days, and it is authority to forgive sins. It is authority to define uh, and empower the Sabbath to do what it's done. And this, this idea of the Son of Man is alluded to much in the New Testament. For example, in Acts chapter 7, verse 56, as Stephen is being martyred, he looks up and he says, look, I see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God. That's an allusion back to Daniel chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 1, uh, John has a vision. He says he sees one like the Son of Man taking authority and power. And we see unfolding throughout the book of Revelation that that one is worshipped. So all of this is is an allusion back to Daniel chapter 7. And when Jesus uses this term Son of Man and is picked up by Stephen and by John in his revelation. They're all gathering back and going to this allusion to Daniel chapter 7. Uh, that, But what's interesting here, of course, is in Daniel 7, he's given sovereign power and authority. But Jesus wants us to understand, even though Daniel doesn't say it in Daniel 7, the Son of Man must first suffer, be rejected and killed, and then he's going to get that glory. The glory pictured in Daniel 7 is the glory that becomes Jesus's after his resurrection and ascension as he comes to the Father and he is pronounced Lord of all and given a name above every name that his name every knee must bow and every tongue confess. But that happens after the crucifixion, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. And so what's interesting is the final thing I'll say about this is Jesus joins the Son of Man and the Messiah in Mark chapter 14. I mentioned this briefly a couple minutes ago, but in Mark 14, we read that the the high priest asked Jesus, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus' response is, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. He's referencing back to Daniel chapter 7, but notice he says, 
you think of the Son of Man and the Messiah as being two different things, but they're actually not. They are one and the same. So even in using the term Son of Man, it also includes all that we think of as the Messianic kings and promises. So the Son of Man is an incredibly rich term. It is what it means to be truly and fully human. It means Jesus was that. It means that he is the second Adam, the true human being. He is the fulfillment of the vision in Daniel chapter 7. And it actually links the Son of Man and the Messiah. They are one and the same. So I encourage you to meditate and think about these sorts of things. It's a very rich term. We don't oftentimes say Jesus, the Son of Man. Uh, as evangelicals today, but we probably ought to use it a lot more often because it is such a rich concept throughout the scripture. So I hope this is helpful and encourages you to walk with and worship the Son of Man. And I look forward to us gathering this week as we're going to take time on Sunday to dive into Isaiah 52 and 53 to look at one of the servant songs, the suffering servant, to meditate a little more on what it means that Christ has come to die uh, for us, to deliver us and bring us into salvation. I hope you have a great week, and I look forward to seeing you this Sunday. Come early, stay late, enjoy time with the people of God. God bless. Mm -hmm.